Awesome. So hi, welcome. Um, this is the um, Salamander reading for issue 57. I'm really excited to have you all here. Uh, we'll be featuring um, our virtual, virtual event features, Temple R. Lovely, Joan Kwan Glass, and Julian Marie Wade. Um, and I'm really excited to have, have them read and, and share their work here. Um, they'll be reading in that order, Temple, um, then Joan, and then Julie, um, with some introductions along the way. Um, feel free to, um, while um, our readers read, feel free to leave comments in the chat. We, we love people showing love in the chat. Um, if lines strike you or anything like that. But if you don't, like, I'm not your boss. You don't have to do that. Um, let's see. We'll, be, we'll also be dropping um, some links for our, um, our for, from our readers as well. So you can check out their work um, and kind of live with their writing a bit more because that's what uh, this whole um, literary journal journey is. Um, and then, yeah, last thing I'll say before... Um, doing our, the first introduction is like, yeah, just thank you for being here, everyone. Um, readers, and we've got our interns here. Thank you to um, Sophia and Darcy um, for, for helping me uh, hold it down. Um, but yeah, thank you all for being here and making time for writing and, um, and for everything that you've survived to get up to this point. Like, thank you for making space for this. All right, so. Starting off with our first reader, uh, our first reader is Temple R. Lovely. Um, one of the things I love about Temple's work is his ability to braid lyric intensity with human presence. There's a dynamic humanity behind his work that is capable of holding space for humor as well as hard-earned insight. Uh, they also just happen to be a marvelous human being. Uh, Temple R. Lovely, he they is a writer, figure model, and gremlin of chaotic, mis mischievous joy. When not creating art, Temple is working with radioactive cats and deciding how to convey gender through daily memes. Please help me welcome Temple. Thank you so much for that, Jose. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, my daytime job sounds fake because I help cats with hyperthyroidism. So, <laughs> but. I will get into it now. So first poem I'm reading is called Elephant in Your Cupboard. And a lot of the uh, collection I'm working on right now is kind of about my experience um, transitioning as well as um, experience with my family. So, all right. Elephant in Your Cupboard. And then you kissed her, gazing into the cupboard of china teacups rimmed in gold leaf with miniature bluebells and bluebirds and blue elephants running around the room, chasing ribbons of gold floating in the soaked porcelain white background, white like her cocktail dress with the crackly crinoline underneath the white dress around teacup, the gold ribbons, her hair in the street lamp, the baby blue sash around her waist with silk in your hands. And when you saw her reflection in the cabinet, you decided to kiss her. You kissed her, hands clasped, cupped, as if to a wine glass shaking in the grasp of a frightened toast. You kissed her and the cupboard clattered, cracked in your wake, swell, releasing a swell, an ocean that breached over the both of you until you could not use the teacups or saucers for float and you drowned. Next is, what makes a good person? What makes a good person? And just so you know, this does have, as a content warning, some um, content about um, sexual assault. I worked as an advocate doing that for a while. So it does have mention of it, but nothing graphic, and also some um, instances of transphobia and racism. What makes a good person? I stand in front of a classroom of 30 teenage boys who keep repeating, there are only two genders. You look in your pants and that's your gender, as if they're repeating themselves will make it true, as if repeating themselves will make me disappear. I'm supposed to be here 
supposed to be teaching them about boundaries and consent, but I did not consent for this. Earlier, I asked the boys to help me make a list of what makes a good person. One boy said Christian. I wrote the word faithful on the board. John 8 reads, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. Over my entire life, more than enough stones have been thrown at me, but I refuse to carry them any longer. I am handing those stones back. You can have them, Father, for it is you who has sinned, not me. You who has taught the children to eat each other, to tear each other apart, bit by bit, stone by stone. You who made me want, who made me swallow so many stones and tried to put them in my hands to hit others. Some of the boys argue that a trans woman is a man and that such people go into the bathroom to assault others. I forget to tell them that one in two transgender folks will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And I don't tell them I was. Instead, I think of the weighted stones in my stomach, how I must fight for acknowledgement every day within myself and how it makes me cry alone for weeks talking to no one, not even me. I think of the woman I love and how every day she must be so brave. She must watch every corner in the bathroom for someone trying to throw stones, no matter what bathroom she chooses. She is not safe. I want to tell them how brave she is, how brave I am. I want to tell them what I am is not a burden or a threat, but contains more joy than they can imagine. And I try, but I can hardly speak over the sound of stones being thrown at me. I don't blame them. They are children. But still, I am. At the end of the class, some of the boys who said nothing but looked at me directly say thank you. They say thank you, miss. I don't correct them. Mm. Time to talk about my dad. <laughs> it's always a good topic, right? Um, this one's called, I think of my father. I think of my father. Would he wear a mask? Or would he, like when they began enforcing seatbelt laws, scoff, rub his gray stubble chin, and scheme a way to jiggy, jimmy rig around caution? Like the seatbelt extender in his Navy Chevy truck he used to trick the safety mechanism and disable the dashboard light and alarm. Would he get vaccinated? Or would he think it had mind control trips or AIDS in it like the articles he searched for, hunched over the permanently indented leather couch, Googling chemtrails and the border wall and dangerous trans people? Is he still feeding the ducks at Fulton Pond, ripping apart tiny pieces of saved stale bread we used to collect together, coughing, maskless? Does he still get his fishing license? Or have the misaligned bolts in his left leg made even walking too hard after these 10 years of silence? I put on my mask. And the poems coming up are more about uh, my childhood and transition. So similar themes of, you know, um, abuse and familial trauma and transphobia, racism issues, things like that. This one's called New Features. Other people see their parents' features. You have your father's early graying hair. You have your mother's nose crinkle. You have your uncle's bellowing, shaking laugh and feel at home. You can trace the carbon bonds and the threads of DNA that shape their bodies sprouting, rooting, and growing through time and feel at home, feel they are reflected. My mirrored features only serve as nightmares, fears on my skin. They serve a history I must remember, but a skin I desperately want to shed. The hint of having humor and inheritance of my father does not bring me solace. What if, like him, my goofy voices, silly mannerisms, and dramatic faces swim in transphobic slurs and racist caricatures? What if my childhood penchant for roughhousing with my uncles, with boiling stomachs, smoldering tense muscles, and witty jabs, turns into the violent fights of their adulthood? 
I need to build something more than the porcelain mushroom homes my mother made, abandoned with the rest of her art for false homes and falser men. I smear cream on my thighs, filled with chemicals and hormones. Small hairs root, sprout, grow, spread across my thighs. Will these fibers be enough to grow a different type of home? My belly swells, my arms thicken, my voice creaks and stutters out, my mirrored features shudder and shift. I spread on more cream. The next one is called Fill My Holes. Fill my hole. Jab, inject, jab, inject, jab, inject. Feel something other than blood leaking through your veins. A prickle or a burn on the skin, sometimes just the cold sensation, like the condensation from your cup of iced coffee somehow slips into your veins. Jab, inject, jab, inject, jab, inject, cut open. Be it ink hormones, medications, anesthesia, you are filled with openings. Strangers' hands inside your chest cavity, your belly, scooping you out like some sort of fucked up meat ice cream. You wonder if it looks like the raw food you feed your cat. Jab, inject, cut, jab, inject, cut, open, open, search, stab, cut again, cut again, cut again. Strangers' hands open you. You know their name what they do, not much else. You know more about your tattoo artist than the person who guided a microscopic camera, a mechanical visioning snake through an incision right below your belly button. Jab, inject, jab, cut open, cut open, cut open, cut, cut, cut. Suture, suture, stitch, mend, close, bandage. You can feel the knitted lines of dissolving thread needle over your chest sewn with precision and bandaged by nameless hands. Raised and ropey are the scars. The suture glue gets caught in your stomach hair and took two weeks to come out. Now only a small bump or blame below your belly button. You get a piercing right above it. Mm -hmm. I have two more poems. This one's called Comfort of Home. Comforts of Home. You want to fall apart in the comfort of your own home. Her small breath on my face, my, her small breaths on my face are fleeting, small pitfalls of trickling life. You want them to stop trying to find solutions to your feelings. Her unexpected seizure forced her teeth into her bed as she wet herself three days ago. You want them to stop asking for your help. I watch maps flash different colors as they turn against me and those I love. Please let me grieve in the comfort of my own home. You only fled a few years ago. Where else can you go? Where else can I go? We will try to make home in this flesh before you can feel that too. And this last one is called Scar Kiss. Scar kiss. When I kiss their belly, things feel like they might be all right. Tiny dangling ringlets of hair tickle my face. Sun stretches their muscles as they roll in my mouth. Handcuffed face, their sighs are symphonies. Let me stay here a while, tucked into the folds of you. Thank you so much. Dude, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Temple. I greatly appreciate it. Um, oh, that was lovely. And yeah, we got all the, be sure to check out all the love you received in the um, in the chat there as well. I'll throw my, my little hands up there too. Mis manitas, mira. Okay, awesome. Um, so I will now begin introducing our next reader. A uh, big fan of Joan Kwan Glass. Um, so let's see. I'm always left feeling grounded when I read a Joan Kwan Glass poem. Her facility with lyric narrative is evident in poems that range from landscapes of daily life to meditations of yearning and revelation. In one poem you'll be hearing tonight, the speaker relates 
Maybe I'm the way I am because I need to know how much my seams can hold. Similarly, I find in her work an invitation to see how much life a poem can hold. Joan Kwan Glass is a Korean diasporic writer, winner of the 2024 Perugia Press Poetry Prize for her manuscript, Daughter of Three Gone Kingdoms, which is gonna be out this year in September. Like, that's awesome. Um, and is also um, author of Night Swim, winner of the Diode Book Prize from Diode Editions 2022. She serves as editor-in-chief for Harbor Review and as a teacher for several writing centers, including Brooklyn Poets and Hudson Valley Writers Center. Joan's poems have been featured or are forthcoming in Poetry Daily, The Slowdown, Poetry Northwest, Ninth Letter, Rattle, The Margins, Tahoma Literary Review, Prairie Schooner, and elsewhere. She's been a finalist for the Dupelo Press Helena Whitehill Book Award and the University of Akron Poetry Prize, and her work has been nominated for the Pushcar Prize and Sundress Best of the Net. Joan lives in coastal Connecticut, where she is a public school educator. And with that, welcome, Joan. Thank you much, so much, Jose. Oh my God, that intro was absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> um, thank you so much for writing that. Um, thank you so much, Temple, for your powerful, transformative work. I was not familiar with your work before I heard you read just now. I'm really, really grateful um, to have heard you read. So I'm going to be reading, I'm just going to give all the content warnings now because there are always a lot in my writing. Um, let's see, I am going to be reading poems that include addiction and recovery, uh, religious trauma, let's see, estrangement, disordered eating. Let's see what else, what other good things are on here. Um, I think that's it. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read uh, was, actually the first two uh, were published in Salamander. So I'll start with those. Um, this one is called On the Eighth Anniversary of Surrender. And it's a poem that I literally wrote um, on my eighth anniversary of my clean date. So I've been, I've now been clean and sober for a little over nine years, but this was my eighth anniversary uh, poem for myself. Distracted by Earth's magnetic field, pulled away from their own survival, birds in their primal journey south sometimes deviate from the flight plan. Even birds stray, and me, I have failed so often in this life a temple of tables upturned, guts spilled out onto the feet of God. I have always chased sabotage. At age 10, filled a notebook on the pastor's sermons with lists of how he was full of shit, then left them behind in the pew. True story. Longing more for escape than for love, I married a good man, then left him two months later. For two decades, I ignored every warning on every prescription bottle. Once, I drove myself to work on the highway in a near blackout, opiate-laced vision reduced to a pinhole of light. That morning, I prayed for the first time in years, hit the accelerator, asked God to blind me. Some of us are desperate for more than salvation. We long to levitate, invent ways to spare ourselves from suffering and avoid the truth that we have become birds who veered too far to make it to warmer, gentler climates on our own. We want to believe there is a way to defeat this world, to control whatever small thing we can, the needle's angle against our withered vein, perfect powdery line cut onto a mirror 
distorting our own reflection. Addicts do not forget we are children of God. We just long to sit beside him and watch the unbearable world from a safe distance. Addicts who surrender decide to fail at the one thing we do perfectly. We look up at the winter sky, bright and cold. Our eyes burn with migration. Um, this next one also published in Salamander has the religious trauma content. Um, it's called Why Some Days I Wish I Still Loved Jesus. The night before I was baptized in my mother's church, I dreamed of drowning. My lungs a sudden pond, fish long gone, eclipsed moon void of breath. How long can I go on actually believing I am different from my mother? I have tried to erase her from myself, scowl away her smile on my face, scoff away her God. Every time I cast a vote, I take pride in voiding hers. My mother flips on the lights when she enters the room and I shut them off. When I was five, I hid in my bedroom closet, listened to her call my name frantically through the house and I did not answer her. She has always been the one to stay and the one I most wished would go. Only a father could watch his son suffer, die on a cross even, and do nothing. If Mary had a daughter instead of a son, would she have spent less time watching the world turn its back on her child, more wondering why her child turned from her? As a girl, I stood beside my mother in the church pew as she sang the old rugged cross by heart. I imagined a love so big that the only way to survive it was to die and be born again. Underwater, I am holding my breath. Instead of fish, a thousand versions of me swim in its growing depths, searching in vain for a way out. Okay. Um, this next poem is called Tornado Season, um, and it was published in Asian American Writers Workshop, The Margins. And I've been trying to publish in that um, magazine for like forever, so I was really excited. Um, here's Tornado Season. A year had passed since my father left, and our youth pastor told me that unlike so many other children, I was one of the lucky ones. At least one of my parents loved me enough to stay. August always transformed Michigan into a brooding world. Thunderclouds unhinged dampened the light. A bruise black herd of swollen bulls crept closer. Nearby lakes whipped into peaks. That August, like every August, tornado sirens drove us groaning into basements with our radios and fruit roll-ups to wait it out. Through the single small window we watched as blooming dandelions lost their wispy heads, levitating from unmowed grass. Broken leaves freed themselves from the soil, disappeared before we could see which direction they went. The sirens eventually stopped. A friendly radio voice said, 
Well, folks, we had a touchdown, but nowhere as bad as we'd feared. Thank God. Thank God. When I imagined the worst, the storm always passed. I was one of the lucky ones. After I wandered around in our yard to scour for damage, surveyed the wilted plants and ravaged trees, watched the sky return itself to the world. Did the animals hiding in their holes see how unafraid I was? I held the severed heads of weeds in my fists, imagined their seeds breaking through the soil, an army of kin repopulating the earth. Um, this next poem is called Even the Moon, and it appeared in Pyrene's Fountain. I think all of these poems, except one, are in um, my forthcoming collection with Perugia, Plas Perugia Press. Uh, but this poem includes um, disordered eating. It's called Even the Moon. My mother has never had alcohol and never finishes her dessert. Sometimes I wonder if this is why we can't understand each other. She wants a daughter so small, the night won't claim her. I want to know a version of her that consumes more than her body wants, insists on becoming uncomfortably full. I devour the sweets she rejects with a wave of the hand and an, oh, I couldn't possibly. Have you ever seen a bird pick through a bowl of seeds, pecking and scattering them with such fury that there are more on the cage floor than in her own belly? Have you ever met a mother who was not a cage? In her womb, I swelled as close to the surface of her as I could without breaking through. Maybe I'm the way I am because I need to know how much my seams can hold. Even the moon slivers herself. Okay, I've got one more poem. Um, this one is called How We Fly. And um, actually this one is in the new book too. Uh, this poem was originally published in Lantern Review, um, which has since closed and I just loved them so much. Um, here's How We Fly. We are watching Iron Man again and the portrait of my harmony hangs on the wall where it has for years. In it, her hanbok is folded across her chest like the wings of a paper crane. I ask my daughter if she'd ever like to visit Korea. She shrugs, ambivalent, announces that she doesn't feel Korean. She has never eaten dried squid or kimchi, has never walked to the marketplace in Myeongdong, or has never been to Jeju to see the brazen and glorious pearl divers she was named after. She has never bitten into a persimmon in November. She can't even swear in Korean. Our Datsun stares at his reflection in the fireplace door, wags his tail, satisfied with the one who looks back at him. On the screen, Tony Stark builds his iron suit from bomb parts, emerges from a cave in a foreign land to obliterate the bad guys with only his fearlessness and his flame-blasting gloves. Why do you love this movie so much? 
I ask. She looks at me as if there could only be one answer. He tries to do his father's work, but doesn't let it hold him back. He isn't a superhero, but he still flies. Soon, Tony Stark will announce who he really is. My daughter will cheer, jump from the couch, clap her hands the way she did as a toddler in her crib when she saw me coming. In the portrait, my Halmoni is still young, but her brow is already furrowed, her hair pinned loosely into a nest. What you don't see in the photo are the birds above her, scattering in all directions. Thank you so much for being here and for listening. Thank you, Joan. Amazing. I, I, yeah, I've read that poem because, and I'm just like, wow, you're really gonna soar out like that at the end. Just amazing. Thank you so much. Be sure to check out all the love in the chat. Um, all right, I will now introduce our final reader. Um, and let's say uh, Julie Marie Wade. So one of the things I admire in Julie Marie Wade's work is uh, her knack for approaching a subject from different angles. In her book, Postage Jew, Poem, Postage Jew, Poems and Prose Poems, specifically the piece Triptych, uh, for example, Wade technically writes three fan letters to Mary Tyler Moore. I say technically because the letters span three different ages in Wade's life. Add to that how the first two letters are addressed to characters played by Mary Tyler Moore, only the last addressed to Moore proper. Through the juxtaposition of these letters and the risks taken across space and time and TV land through this structure, so much life gets said. It's just, I really geek out about this, this piece and I, um, I've taught it a couple of times. Um, and so, yeah, she puts a lot, it, it's, it's a, a knack for putting a lot of things in play and then now uh, kind of letting them resonate. Um, and tonight she's going to work her magic on the subject of frogs, and I'm going to just leave it at that. Uh, Julie, uh, Julie Marie Wade is a member of the creative writing faculty at Florida International University in Miami. Uh, her newest lyric essay collections are Fugue and Oral History from Diagram New Michigan Press and Otherwise Essays, Autumn House 23, selected by Leah Purpura for the 2022 Autumn House Press Nonfiction Book Award. Um, without further ado, welcome, Julie. Wow, thank you so much, Jose. I didn't know you were gonna mention the Mary Tyler Moore triptych and that just, I'm always happy to talk about Mary Tyler Moore and fan letters. So thank you for mentioning that. And thank you um, for inviting me to read. And it is a joy to read with Temple and with Joan and also to see um, Laura and Kate and other folks I know in the audience. But um, it's always nice to see familiar faces and to read with new friends. Um, so I am actually, in terms of my time, um, it turns out that the lyric essay that is in the new issue of Salamander uh, runs in about 12 minutes. So it it fits in with, um, with that space. And I'm just going to read um, the whole thing. Uh, I do uh, write with my students a lot. And a lot of what ends up becoming coming in my classroom. So um, this actually started in response to um, reading a bestiary um, by Lily Huang with my students a few years ago. Um, we've read it since, but um, it started in a free write of um, drawing from a fairy tale that you remember um, encountering as a child and how it connected with something like a formative moment in your life. Um, so, so here's where I went. The Plague of Frogs. I grew up expecting them, dreading them. That appointed hour in biology class when the dead, or worse, the still alive and only just anesthetized frogs would be presented to us for dissection. I pictured the trays and scalpels, the classroom lights dimmed, the diagram projected on the main screen, which was unlatched with half a broomstick from a scroll above the chalkboard, a froggy green, in fact while before us the rows and rows of slick, unmoving bodies splayed. Was this not adolescence as metonym? Was this not the epitome of what it meant to be a girl? I felt for this frog I had never seen. 
I felt for this frog I saw in myself, not just a frog in the throat I couldn't stop clearing, but a frog of circumstance, iced, stunned, forever pending until it was done with until it became waste. But this was part of the lore after all, what our parents had done and their parents before them. This was the amphibian gospel handed down. And truly more than once, a well-meaning elder had uttered the phrase, rite of passage. I did not know frogs from real life, which is to say I had never encountered frogs in their natural habitat. How did they live? For how long and where? Each spring, my parents unwrapped from newspaper the statue of a frog, large, green, and gregarious-seeming, a bullfrog, I suppose, and placed it beside a comparably-sized statue of a mushroom in their yard, red cap speckled with large white spots, a toadstool, perhaps? What even was the difference? Each autumn, they rewrap these two and place them deep in a box, then high on a shelf that only a ladder could reach. Imposed hibernation for painted frog and fungus alike. Sometimes at aquariums, I recall a small glass square set apart for the non-fish, creatures defined mostly by what they were not. In this case, not the specimens typically observed in such a place, but extra, otherwise, bonus life forms transgressing a pre-approved list. Behind that glass, we glimpsed a world part aquatic, part telluric, a little pond with a slippery rock, so curated, I sensed it even then, bright green leaves extending from a diminutive tree by the wall. All toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. They taught us in school a well-worn construction for explaining relationships. This is always that, but that is not always this as in from religion class, all basilicas are cathedrals, but not all cathedrals are basilicas. The Pope had to make a special designation to elevate one cathedral from near large church to more important, less near large church. It seemed some frogs had been elevated from the mereness of toad, the mere walking and hopping of toad, to the great leaping of frog, almost a form of flight. In cartoons, though, frogs, which might have been toads but also might not, seem to sit contentedly on lily pads, waiting for a fly to come along. Then their pink tongues would uncoil like rolls of bubble tape and snap up the fly with a satisfied gulp. A once popular insult to lob at our peers was horny toad. We didn't know then, some may not still, that the horny toad is actually a lizard, meaning a reptile, meaning neither frog nor toad. The word horny registered only as elementary risque, on the cusp, but just short of some larger accusation of desire. Oh, you're such a horny toad, which begged a clarification no one could give, at least not without incriminating themselves. It seemed we meant a horny toad was a pleasure seeker, too alive, quite the opposite of anesthetized, someone pent and eager for something we weren't supposed to name, even acknowledge we could want. Close contact? No one said intimate yet. A friend becoming more than a friend? Everyone rattled off this phrase, but only because it was vague. A hand that wasn't your own, moving over, then under your clothes. And not just that, but desiring that, yearning for that to happen. The words horny toad clamp down quick as the cartoon frog's tongue. Implicitly, enough of you. Don't even go there. Our fear so great of the toad within, which was complicated, of course, by the composition of an all-girls school. Who were the toads now, if they had always been boys before? Which brings me inevitably to the frog prince, that formative story from the Brothers Grimm. 
Memorable incipients awash in concrete nouns. A princess with her golden ball, a linden tree leaning over, a pond spreading below, like the kind the non-fish were rumored to be so fond of. Then a frog retrieving that ball, asking only for friendship in return. Friendship, being abstract, tilts the story away from the play-by-play, -play, bends it towards symbolism. What girl hadn't been told by a boy that he was only looking for a friend, that he liked her for the whole person she was, that they didn't have to go all the way. Implicitly, I'm not a horny toad. How dare you think such a thing? But he was a toad at least, since toads are always frogs, and as the story goes, he was also a man. Oh yes, he wants to enter her castle. Of course, he wants to share her sumptuous meal. Why, certainly, he wants to sleep on her pillow. No hint of funny business at all. Like frogs ourselves, we leap ahead, ahead, to the moment when she kisses him, some missing plot points there, trying not to squirm as we imagine putting our own mouths on a frog's external nares. He can't really kiss her back, can he? Not in that form. So her lips have to press down on his must be moist skin, make him into the man who can kiss her back, transform him into an appropriate species to love. But we forget this is not the grim version, leap back, back then to the primary account where the princess throws the frog hard against a wall, his body on impact, breaking the spell. Here, the frog's death, that horrendous splat, liberates the man to emerge from, well, his carcass. I want to know about the moments leading up to this one, the moments that seem so much less about desire, not Kill me to save me, my dear. I'd love for my organs to become a mural smear. Oh no. It was fury she must have felt as she cast him out. The frog with his bulbous eyes watching her undress. The frog who came to her croaking under false pretense. Just friendship or don't worry, I'm a gay frog with no sexual interest in you at all. Just imagine it, the cat whose paw fiddles with the door, then flings it wide, staring at you in the bath, yawning while you're on the commode, was actually a man in disguise. Voyeur, you cry. But it sounds too chic, doesn't it? Almost a compliment. Peeping Tom. Now too benign, more like a caricature than a crime. Asshole. You're getting closer now, and the cat that isn't a cat gets catapulted ha, huh, toward the wall, good riddance, except now you're alone in your house with an unwelcome guest. First comes trust, then comes rage, then comes what? Doubting your own story, wondering whether anyone would ever believe. It all leads to a frazzled mixed drink, fright, bitters, coercion to taste. I can see why the modern story softens violence to a kiss, Grotesque, yes, but at least the girl goes bestial by choice. Surely someone's heard a frog kink. Surely other kids are doing it by now. The frog prince of old is the tide pot of new. We get it, sort of. But back to me in 10th grade and glimpsing that toad in myself. Girl body as frog suit. The implicit grotesqueness every girl internalizes about her body. No horny toads in the sanctum of single sex education, though. But what else could I be? The brochure advertised that girls would flourish as leaders in the absence of competition with boys. For four years, we were promised success on our genderless laurels alone. And another, the rhymed phrase tossed around almost jubilantly, no attraction distraction. Without those boy frogs in the mix, every girl could keep her eye on the golden ball of her own accomplishment, but not me. And was I really alone, whose eyes couldn't help wandering to the front, to the side, even partially behind me? Did you know frogs have nearly 180 degree vision? 
Guilty as the other girls changed for gym class. Guilty as the other girls swam and showered together. All day my deaf tympanum drumming the indictment. Horny toad, horny toad, horny toad. All day the terror of being exposed like the frog's heart still beating in some versions of the terrible experiment. I'm not going to do it, I announced at home. I can't slice into a frog like that. How could I live with myself? My father, Air Force during Vietnam, called me a CO, and I saw disgust flash across his face. Yes, I had a conscience. Yes, I was objecting, but it wasn't my innocence I sought to preserve, rather my deepest identifications. How are you going to be a surgeon someday if you can't even cut into an animal? My mother sighed. This was her dream, not mine. So I left it once again unanswered. The loophole was to write an essay, I heard, explaining why you required an alternate assignment. Now that I could do. I could write and write around the truth on my steno pad, which of course was my lily pad, which was of course my sight of forever unnamed shame. I am the frog was all I wanted to say. I am the frog and I refuse to destroy myself. But on the morning when the trays and scalpels came, there were squid and fetal pigs instead. Dissecting frogs is an antiquated practice, the teacher said. In response, only a rivet escaped my lips. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you so much, Julie. That was amazing. Be sure to check out the love in the chat. Um, let's hear it for everyone. Let's throw up some reactions there. That's lovely. Yeah, no, I... Um, I'm always surprised. <laughs> I don't know why, but I'm just like, right, I've I've seen some of this work before. If I've been you know, on fans and I'm like, but then then y'all read and it's just, yeah, knocks me out. So thank you so much to our readers. Uh shout out to um our interns, uh Darcy and Sophia. Um, and thank you to everyone who came and participated here. Um, everyone have a good night. We'll have the link up on our YouTube page shortly. All right. Take care.